What is happening, everybody? So it's Tuesday, and we're just doing our little random live stream, little hangout thing here with you all. I got some questions from comments on YouTube over the last few days. A lot of people have a lot of opinions about these last couple of videos that we just did, so figured we'd chat about that a little bit. And then you saw the thumbnail. Um, it's actually related to the video that came out on my, uh, yesterday, so... Uh, we'll talk about that somewhat as well. So I hope everybody is having a good time. Do me a favor, and uh, if you want to ask a question, put it in the comments down there and put question marks in front of it, and I will try to find it. Um, I am by myself. Leslie's not with me on Tuesdays, so it's a little bit harder. If you want to jump to the top of the line, you can use a super chat. Other than that, uh, let's just get going. So basically with these things, what I've been doing is just hanging out with you all for a few minutes and sharing a couple of things. Uh, and we'll get into the thumbnail thing as a matter of course of this conversation because a couple of questions that came in um, over the week. Uh, let's see, just a couple actually. Uh, one really interesting question on our Enya carbon fiber guitar review, which they actually just reached out with, to me for another one uh, this morning, which is pretty cool, uh, for a different guitar that they make. So I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, do you think that HPL guitars are an affordable alternative to composite guitars in terms of resistance to temperature and humidity? Um I have an HPL guitar. I actually have the little baby Martin. Um, and I have the close travel guitar in carbon. They are not even in the same league. HPL, it is fun. That little Martin is really fun. It's actually a video that I want to do coming up is kind of a battle of the synthetic materials when we're talking about this HPL stuff. Um, Martin uses it on a few different models, and it is cool. It f sounds fine. It's very, uh, you know, durable, but it doesn't sound anything like carbon fiber. Carbon fiber sounds way, way, way better. Um, and I know that there are many people um, that would get in the comments to a video and be like, well, I tried a guitar, blah, 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 years ago, and it was crap. My favorite one is, I played an Ovation in 1982, therefore all carbon fiber sucks. And just, it just isn't true because the, um, you know, carbon is, carbon is awesome now. It didn't used to be, um, but it is now. It's very, very good. Um, that HPL stuff is, is very cool. Um, my video editor is calling me right now texting me all right i will call him back cool um yeah so the hpl stuff is very cool but it's just not as good as carbon um it feels weird it sounds weird it is i will say and i'm going to put this in the video when i do it um the little baby martin that i have it's actually my daughter's but i keep it here is when you play it and you really lean on it and really play it hard, it almost gives you like a distorted sound because it kind of runs out of motion, if that makes sense. I mean, all wood does to some extent, but this kind of does sooner and it gives you this sort of like overdriven sound, an acoustic sound. It's kind of neat, actually. Um, I really find it kind of cool. But again, uh, hey, hey, everybody, who we got in here? Uh, Randy, G, Mike, we got another Mike. Ah, that's Mike Resendez is my video editor. Hi, uh, now I know why you didn't pick up. Exactly. Aaron, uh, Daniel, Robert. Hey, everybody. Uh, Burzak, Ben Burzak, custom guitars. Very cool. So, yeah, so th those are pretty cool guitars. So let's get into this little subject that I want to talk about because I want to get your opinion on it and have a little conversation about it. Um, and I think it's going to be a good conversation. The other question that I... Oh, wait. There is one other question that I want to address. On the how to set intonation on a Stratocaster. 
Somebody said you've missed the how, misunderstood the how and why. Well, here, let's get to that in a minute. We have a super chat. Uh, let's see. Hi, Dylan. Great content. Maybe an awkward subject, but what about guitar picks? Should we throw them away when they sound bad? Should we file them to give it an extra life? Oh, that's a good question. I say do whatever you want with that. Um, thank you for the super chat, by the way. I say do whatever you want with that. Um, I know a lot of people that will take a brand new pick and like run it on the carpet to kind of wear it in a little bit and get rid of that sharp edge. So whatever sounds good to you is what you do. My dad, when I was a kid, my dad would use um, bread tab things, like from a bread bag. Um, I mean, I, you can use anything for a pick, really. So use whatever wear pattern you want to use on it, as long as it sounds good to you. That's a really personal thing, so I say just use use whatever you want. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That's a cool question though. It's funny to think about how many different people use picks all kinds of different ways, right? Um, and I don't think there is really a right or a wrong answer there as long as it sounds good to you and it, it makes you play well enough, you know? Um, okay. So Victor says, you've misunderstood the how and why some people use a harmonic to intonate a guitar. The idea is not to intonate harmonic against the open string, which is indeed pointless, but to intonate the fretted note against the harmonic. Okay, this is also pointless. Um, I understand why you would say that. So what he's talking about is you fret the 12th fret, you pluck it, then you unfret the 12th fret and hit the harmonic on the 12th fret. And if they match, the guitar is intonated properly. If they are out of tune with each other, um, then the guitar is out of intonation. Here's the problem. It's a redundant action, and the only time you would do that is if you did not have a tuner, and unless you are very, very, very aware of pitch, um, you may not get it right. That's basically a tuning by ear situation. Um, and it is my opinion, because a tuner, a good tuner, can tune more accurately than your ear can, um, a single note, so when you tune a single note like that, you can only hear, I want to say it's three cents different in pitch, which is actually kind of a lot. And of course, more there will be people that can hear um, more accurately than that, but the average human being can only hear three cents or a little less. A good guitar tuner, actually most cheap guitar tuners these days, can go down to a tenth of a cent. So the guitar tuner is better than you, bar none, no matter what. I don't care how good you think you are. Um, I don't care if you're Rick Beato's kid um, on his video. You cannot hear pitch as good as a tuner can hear it. That being said, um, if you don't have one, you could use that but I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I would still use a tuner. So yeah, very cool. So I just want to address that because I didn't want people to feel misled by that. It, it can be done. I just don't think that it should be done. Okay, so we put out this video about the St. James uh, by Blackstar. And it's a fantastic amplifier. It's really, really good. And it's funny because it's one of those amps that people want to hate. I want to do a whole video on why people don't like things anymore. I feel like guitar players just like want to not like stuff, which is so weird to me. But people just don't want to admit that this guitar amp is good. The number one objection that they had to this amp was that it won't last very long that black stars aren't serviceable. Um, I understand your point. I do get it. But how long does something have to last these days? And I know that sounds weird, but 
Nothing lasts that long these days. And the Black Star is not unique in the... Um, Black Star is not unique in the aspect of it not being serviceable. Really, no modern guitar amp, unless it is hand-wired, which is not a modern guitar amp, is really that serviceable. Um, my friend Andy uh, Fuchs at Fuchs Amplification posts on his Instagram all the time all these common amps that we all play, you know, Hot Rod DeVille's, even Princeton's, even all these other amps, and all kind of Fender amps, all kind of Marshalls that have PCB boards in them. And when something goes wrong and a voltage gets out of spec, it burns a hole in the PCB board and the thing is junk and you have to throw it away. Like, this amp is not serviceable, but most amps are not serviceable these days. And the majority of people, please let me know in the comments. So there's a couple of stages to this. Let me know in the comments what amp you are currently playing right now. What is your number one amplifier that you're currently playing right now? Please put it in the description or in the chat right now. Please let me know what amp you're playing because I want to get kind of a gauge uh, of all of us that are chatting about this right now. And then the other thing is whether it's a guitar, maybe these need to be separate, right? Whether it's a guitar or an amp, how long do you expect that it should last if you pay? It doesn't matter, actually. It doesn't matter how much it costs. How long should it last? Because I heard something this morning. I was listening to a Rhett Scholl video, and they were it was the dude from Five Watt World and Rick Beato and him, and they were talking about vintage guitars. And somebody said, the reason a vintage guitar is around anymore is because nobody played it because it wasn't that good. If it was a really good guitar, it would be played out and it would be worn out by now. The funny thing is, is that 90% of the guitars that people play, uh, in my experience and in our YouTube comments, are not old guitars. They don't expect things to last. Um, so... We got a Boss Katana and a Fender DeVille. We, let's see, have an iRig Micro Amp, a Marshall Origin 50, a Marshall VS100, a Victi Victory V40. Um, so we have an AC15 hand wired. So you are probably, so far, like kind of the anomaly, right, in this. Uh, Mesa Rectoverb. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. So far, Yamaha THR10, Vox AC10, and a Roland Blues Cube. None of those amps are any more serviceable, save for the hand wired AC15. Good on you, sir. Um, are, are any more serviceable than this Black Star right here. None of them. Because they all have PCB boards in them. They all have stuff that can get hot. Um, everybody says, well, this thing is going to be less reliable because it doesn't have blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the thing. Heat kills electronics. 100% end of story. The only thing that kills a semiconductor, they're kind of indestructible, is heat. So, if it's shielded well, and if it's heat synced well, it will last a very, very, very long time. And this amp has less heat in it than another amp because it has one less set of tubes in it. Uh, this dude's got a Tone King. Somebody says, that's a great sales pitch. It won't last, but so what? It's not about that. It's not about that at all. First of all, I'm not trying to sell anything. I think I just wanted to have the conversation because it's just... <laughs> This is just like the sustain argument, okay? Everybody is so concerned about sustain, but nobody cares. I don't want to hear you play a nine second long note. Nobody plays like that. 
So why do we even argue about it? We argue about it, or I don't, I don't care, but people argue about it on the internet because it's a spec sheet that you can look at. So they, they look at these metrics that don't really matter to decide whether they're going to buy something or not. So when you look at, or, or they'll almost um, have a double standard about it. So for example, you'll have something on your pedal board that is just as cheaply made as this amp or a Marshall DSL 40 or a iRig or a anything else is, you know, but you'll have a pedal board with a bunch of stuff on it, or you'll have a power supply for your pedal board, which is exactly the same kind of power supply that's in this amp. Um, and you'll not think twice about it. So I think it's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, my Bugera 3, 333XL went bang a few weeks ago, five years old. See, and I would expect that amp to last about that long. That amp is n um, nothing against your gear because those are cool amps. But those are cheaply made copies of other circuits with PCB boards with cheaper materials built down to a price, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Bugera has kind of always been that. That and the V22 and some of those other amps. They've kind of been built down to a price to make an affordable tube amp for those of us that could not afford, you know, a vintage Princeton, right? So that's why they exist. Therefore, they are by design, and I don't mean that the guitar company designed them to only last a certain time to fail to make you buy a new one. I don't mean controlled obsolescence. I just mean it's cheap, so it's not going to last as long. But that's everything. The other thing is, if this is $1,200 and your iPhone is $1,200, you're going to get a new iPhone in two years. Why not get another amp in two years? So I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying we need to zoom out and look at the bigger picture because gear doesn't need to last 70 years for it to be uh, cost effective. In actuality, a lot of the um, vintage gear that we think is so cool doesn't last as long as we think it does. Um, Fender guitars, old Fender guitars, like let's take a mid 60s telly. If you get a good mid 60s telly, it's going to need a new switch, it's probably going to need new pots. And it's probably going to need at least one pickup rewound unless you're paying top vintage dollar for it. But for a guitar that you're going to play, it's going to need some parts replaced. The way Fender um, pickups were designed in the 60s with plain enamel wire, they're just going to go bad because the insulation on the wire was not very durable. You'd sweat through it. It was very brittle. It would become brittle with age, which poly wire that we use doesn't do that anymore. But it used to. So you have this thing that everybody thinks is so amazing, but it actually doesn't last very long in guitar land. But I mean, how long do you need it to last? 70 years is a pretty long time. 60 years, 50 years, 40 years. So um, I, mean, I don't understand how long people expect things to last. So here's a question. If you were to buy a new guitar amp today whatever new guitar amp i'm not talking about going and buying a vintage piece whatever's on the market today it could be this it could be a new marshall it could be a new fender it could be a new tone master it could be a digital thing it could be a whatever how long what what is it so put this in the chat too if you're going to buy a new amp today what is that amp and how long do you expect A, it to last, or B, you to keep it until you move on to something else? I'm curious. Put that in the comments as well. Somebody else, I think Charles is the one that inspired me to ask this question because he said he'd like to get 10 years out of his Boss Katana, which actually is realistic. And that's a $200 amp. That's actually kind of realistic. Um, I want a guitar pick that lasts 70 years. 
My 63 Strat has had a new switch, a new jack, and all pickups rewound and three refrets. Refrets, I get. I almost look at frets as like a wear item, like tires on a car. But the pickups thing, exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. Um, I just think it's an interesting thing to think about. I'm trying to... Uh, does anyone still make tubes for amps anymore? And if not, how long will the current supply last? Uh, yeah, tubes the, Tubes are going to be fine. You're going to be able to get tubes. They're not going to be cheap. They're going to get more expensive. But I think you'll be able to get tubes with no issues whatsoever. Bugueras are known to be cheap and unreliable. No, I wouldn't say that. I would say that they are just a less expensive amp that is made with cheaper stuff for the person who usually um, buys those amps they'll be fine if you're a professional musician playing five nights a week three nights a week um, don't buy a Bugera because that's not what that amp is made for I want to do a video about why there is no good no bad gear anymore the only reason there's bad gear is because people buy the wrong gear for what they're using it for. And, and the Bouguera is an excellent example of that. I think, like I said, if you're a professional musician, you just don't buy a Bouguera. But if you have one at home in your studio and you play a couple of nights a week, just, you know, piddling around, um, it's probably great. and It'll probably last a long time. Um, let's see. But my 78 Plexi keeps on going. However, you probably have to put caps in it. You probably have it probably has to go to your amp guy. That's what I'm saying. So that, that needs to be serviced as well. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find, let's see. Fender Super. We've got all kinds of stuff in here. Um, hang on, I'm trying to catch up to you. Y'all are going fast. Fender Tone Master Deluxe, and I would like to, it to last 10 years. So I think that that's probably not out of the question because that thing is pretty solid. I don't know that it will last 10 years, but it might last... It would be like a two rock or a matchless, and I would expect it to last for decades. That probably won't happen. You'll probably have to have some service work. There. So that's the other thing. I think some of these these fancy tube amps and some of the more expensive stuff. It's it's like buying an exotic car. You you just kind of know, like on a Ferrari Testarossa, that every couple of years, every five years, you're gonna have to do an engine out service, and it's gonna cost X amount of dollars. I think if you have a two rock or if you have a matchless or something like that, you're going to just have to know <laughs> that every couple few years, if you use it a lot, that it's a possibility that you're going to have to have, you know, that engine out service, if that makes sense. Um, I think, you know, that's kind of the thing. Um, caps on a fender last a day longer than the warranty. Dude, that's totally true. An origin 50 for five years. I get that. Um... Somebody says that uh, he wants his like, gear to last as long as possible based on budget and wants to fix it himself. I get that too. Um, I get that too. I've been wanting an AC30 for a while and I expect it to last indefinitely aside of tube replacement as needed. But I play, relative, I play at home and relatively low volume. Chances are that will happen for you, Ben. Um, the only thing is, is that Unless you get a hand-wired one, you have this whole unreliability of a PCB board. It's not unreliable. It's just part of it. Um, I don't think servicing things is a negative. I don't either. I think it's part of it. But I think when we think about um, the money we're spending or the gear we're buying, I think we need to build that in. And I think you can't – people think uh, that if you have this Black Star – for five years and then it breaks. They, for some reason, would juxtapose that to some vintage Princeton that has lasted for 50 years. 
but that Princeton has not lasted for 50 years. It has needed tubes, it has needed caps, it has needed the pots cleaned out, it's probably needed a speaker, it's needed some service. There's been some work that's gone into making that thing last 50 years. And so it's not fair to do a exact A to B comparison, this amp lasts five years or however long, versus something that we perceive to last so long when it when in reality the guy that's using it has been spending 300 bucks every couple years to keep the thing up you know what i mean that's that's kind of where i'm coming from on it um my ac30 was great at throwing flames out the back every few months oh that's funny that is really funny um yeah, I think I think the servicing thing is the key is to understand that that all this vintage gear didn't just get here. You know, it just didn't last just because it's an old Marshall. It lasted because somebody took care of it. You know, um, yeah. And I think it's it. And I think when we when we see these comments, that's why I wanted to bring this up. Um, these things on Tuesday, I think I, I really just want to share, I don't know, random thoughts that have come out of the comments that are like people make these crazy generalizations. And then I feel like uh, sometimes what comes out of the comments is like frustration with your with their own experiences with gear, when in actuality, it might be a misunderstanding of their experiences with the gear, if that makes sense. So it's not necessarily to say anybody was wrong, but just to be like, okay, let's rethink about this and look at actually what went into it. And that's kind of why I wanted to talk about this today. There are a lot of YouTubers that hate Blackstar amps. It really surprised me. They won't even review them. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, and I'll just tell you this. My first one didn't work. It worked for like four days, I think. Um, I got this. Well, let's see. I ordered one as soon as they announced it. I ordered it from Sweetwater. And it got here. And I used it for, mm, I don't know, maybe four or five days. And it just quit. Um, I don't know why. I it, what, it didn't blow up. There was no bad tubes in it. It was not a power supply thing. I think it was just like a faulty switch or something. I don't know what was wrong with it. All I know is it just quit working. The sound just stopped coming out. So I called them up and they swapped it out for me. Sweetwater was awesome too because they sent me, I don't know if you know this or not, but if you if you have a return with Sweetwater, what you can do is give them a credit card number and they'll just, um, if you don't return the bad one, They'll charge your credit card for both of them in however many days, like 20 days or whatever. So anyway, they sent me the new one before I had to send the old one back. And I actually used the new one for a few days before I sent the old one back. It was really cool. Um, I didn't know if you know Sweetwater did that or not. That's not just for me either. That's all everybody. Um, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to be one of those YouTubers. I know that there's a lot of people. Um, that have a one bad experience with the product and are like, I'm never, ever going to buy that product again. And I'm like, or they'll hear it. Uh, I should say I'm one of these people that um, I don't just take other people's word for stuff and then make like this hardcore opinion about it. I want to experience it for myself first. And so I've never owned a Black Star product before. And I had heard, I had seen many people say, this thing is going to suck. It's going to break in two weeks. It's going to blah, 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 all these things. And I'm like, okay, A, have you experienced this? Or are you just taking some pissed off YouTuber's word for it? And B, did you give it a shot? Like, was it a bad one? How was the customer service? Did they swap it out for you? Where did you buy it from? How were you using it? All these various things. And so instead of just saying, I'm not going to review one of those things, um, I was like, no, I'm going to. I'm going to review it. And when the, when the one failed on me, I'm like, I'm going to see how cool they are about this. And they were cool. 
So they swapped it out and I've had no problems since and it's been my favorite amp that I've had for a long time. I did not put the failure in the review. I don't know why, I guess I just forgot to say it. Um, but I'm not afraid to talk about it. Obviously I'm telling you now, I, it, it's fine though. Um, but I'm, I am just not a person to take other people's word for. If you tell me something sucks or if you tell me I really about people, if you tell me this person is a jerk, I'm going to log the information, but I'm not going to make my own opinion until I find out for myself. Um, so, you know, this kind of fell into that category um yeah let's see here if you take care of your gear it will never let you down that's true yeah man yeah so you know i could have just said i'm never going to review one of these things again it's a piece of crap but I also know that last week I had a, and just this is just being 100% honest, I had a single, single hum pick guard. I shipped it to a client and he emailed me and he's like, um, this thing doesn't work. And I was, so I sent him a call tag. I had him ship it back to me. Um, and I'm like, oh crap, I screwed up. And this is why. And it took me two minutes to fix it. I priorityed it back to him. And he'll be totally fine. And it'll be awesome. But I know that I have to deal with that sometimes. Because we are all imperfect. And we all make mistakes. And I, why would I... Um, why would I expect that of anybody else? Why would I expect perfection from anybody else? So, you know. How long do pickups last? Uh, we talked about this a, a little bit ago. Um, vintage pickups will last a long time, but plain enamel wire, the insulation is very brittle as it gets older. And so as it gets older, it is subject to corrosion. And poly wire is almost indestructible. So like this wire right here on these pickups, this is actually poly nylon. Um, this stuff is almost indestructible as long as you don't burn it. Um, and so this, these will probably last forever, but they're all, everything's subject to corrosion. If you use steel wool to clean your frets and the little bits get stuck in the, in the pickups, um, then they'll be subject to corrosion. They'll rust out and they'll give you trouble. What do you think about Fender being sued for overcharging? Um, we did, um, a video on this. I, so here's the thing. Not all laws are the same in all countries. What they got in trouble for was for, um, map pricing which is minimum advertised pricing, which means that if you have a product, the company makes a rule that says you cannot advertise on your website or you cannot advertise in a flyer or something um, or in an ad below a particular price. So they did not overcharge they, that's not what they got sued for. They got sued for price fixing, which means that they were saying you cannot sell it for below this price because in Europe and in Britain, I believe, um, and if you're from either one of those places and you want to correct me on this, but I think it's both, you cannot have minimum advertised pricing. In the United States, we can. So that's not to say that you cannot sell it for less than that. So I have minimum advertised pricing. Um, our single coils are $99.95. And if you are a dealer, I will not allow you to sell them for less than that. 
um, or advertise them for less than that. Now, if you want to make a deal with your buddy and give him, you know, 50 bucks off and take a loss, that's not on me. You can do that if you want, but you cannot advertise a lower price than what I tell you. Since that practice is illegal in um, Europe and England, they got sued for that. So it's not that they were overcharging. They were not overcharging for anything. They were, they were fixing their minimum price. The reason minimum advertised pricing came into play in the United States is to really to help the smaller business. That was how it was intended. For example, Sweetwater can buy so many things that they get them cheaper and they could undersell somebody else. But if the dealer says you can only sell it for a hundred bucks, you can only advertise for a hundred bucks, then that means small guy down the street who's fighting to survive and big guy have to sell it for the same price. Therefore, it helps the small guy. Did it work that way perfectly? Not really, but that was the spirit behind it. It just so happens that you can't do that in Europe and England. So that's why. They were not overcharging. Um, they were, they call it price fixing, but it's minimum ad advertised price. I uh, don't care about it because it does not affect me. I, I That sounds bad, but I love minimum advertised pricing. I think it works great because I am a small business and because it builds more profit in for the folks that sell my products for me, although we don't really have any, many dealers right now. but um, And I think it works for small businesses. Some would disagree with me and they feel differently about it because of their situation is different. It's just kind of one of those things that some people agree with and some people don't. But I actually like minimum advertised pricing. Unless I'm trying to buy an Apple computer, then I like wish there was no minimum advertised pricing and I could get a better deal on an Apple computer. But there you go. There's gives and takes to everything. Um, so the reason I don't have an opinion on that lawsuit is because they have different laws over there. And that does not affect me. So I don't care about that. That is outside of my, my realm. Was Fender doing a bad thing? I, I don't know because I don't know how they were trying to apply what we do here to over there. I don't know the particulars about it enough. Um, I am very sensitive, I will tell you right now, um, I am very, people are trying to say a lot of bad things about Fender right now, and I disagree with almost all of it. Um, people on our Fender video in the comments were like, well, they're overcharging for everything, it serves them right. They're not overcharging. I'm not overcharging. We are not overcharging. I'll, I'll lump myself, I'll just say, I'll lump myself in with it. Music companies are not overcharging for gear. The prices of things are going up. And if we are to survive, the prices have to go up. Because a Fender guitar has gone up Let's say a Mexican Fender guitar has gone up a hundred bucks in the last year and a half. So that's because everything else has gone up. I mean, Fender still has to pay their people. Well, not as many now. Eggs are now $3 a carton. So I've heard, I don't really buy eggs, but I mean, everything has gone up. So it's not, nobody's overcharging for anything. Stuff is just expensive and you just have to deal with it. I mean, that's really all it is. Map also pushes up the prices manufacturers can charge. It's a double-edged sword. So that's an interesting thing. It So this is where um, you're right. What happens is they can then fix the profit margin wherever they want it, um, working backwards, if that makes sense. Which I do as well. You have to do that to continue to 
function. I think a lot of the hateful comments about this kind of stuff come from a misunderstanding of how a business is run, to tell you the truth. Um, and I might sound like a bad guy here, but I've run a business for a really long time and I've done it successfully a few, quite a few times. And you, there is a, there are formulas that you have to follow that if you don't follow them, you will not survive. It's, that is how it is. And as those formulas change, um, and as long as you don't lose sight of what you're trying to do as a business, um, you know, if you're a public company, then that kind of obviously gets a little sketchy. But uh, as a small business like me, um, if as long as you don't sight of the goal, lose sight of the goal of what you're trying to do, which is trying to make really awesome products for people so that your guitar sounds better, that's what I do. Um, as long as you don't lose sight of that, and you follow that formula, you'll be fine. It's the people that don't follow that formula that cause the problems. There are companies, there are, for example, in MySpace, there, I don't mean MySpace like the website, I mean like in my space, like what I do for work, there are pickup companies that I can think of right now uh, in the United States who are making made in the USA pickups and they are selling humbuckers for maybe what should be wholesale price. They're selling them as list price on their, on their websites. That hurts me because people think I'm too expensive. That hurts them because they're not making the profit margins they should. And what they've done is they've cut themselves painted themselves into a corner to never be able to grow um, because they do not have the money to develop new product. They don't have the money to advertise. They don't have the money to scale. They don't have the money to um, establish a dealer network or any kind of sales network because the profit is already sucked out of their pricing. So if you're going to be a successful business, there are formulas that you really need to follow. Otherwise, it just doesn't happen. Fender is following those formulas. I look at an $849 made in Mexico guitar and I'm like, I understand why it costs $849 or $879 or whatever it costs. I get it. I totally get why Fender guitars cost what they cost. And I am very unpopular in this opinion, but I think that an American made guitar should cost $2,000. That's all it is. It should cost that much. Um, that's what they should cost, period. And I'm okay with paying it. I got to save up, um, you know, or buy on credit or whatever. You know, you know, we can't afford to. But it is a luxury item that you have to save up for. Um, and I think that's just the way it is. But I think that's how much they should cost. And I am, people will flame me in the comments for that, but I, I don't care. I, I look at the business side of it. And then look at the product that I'm getting and I'm like, that's what it should cost. Now, the 50% rework rate and all of the quality issues is a separate issue that should be handled internally and I should get a good product. However, I, as a consumer, I'm good at buying stuff, will not take a bad product. If you accept a less than good guitar you are making the problem worse. So return that guitar. Refuse that guitar. Do not take that guitar. Hold them accountable for their quality. Don't get on the internet and tell everybody how much they suck. Just hold them accountable for the product that you want. If you want a Fender Strat and you get it and the frets are all crappy and the finish is all crappy and the pit guard doesn't fit right, send it back. Get one that's good and hold them accountable for that, they need that. I think all these brands need that. But that does not make that product, a good version of that product, worth less. It just means they need to fix those problems internally. Um, I just, you know, if you get a bad pickup from me, it happens every once in a while, uh, like that pick guard the other day. That does not make my products worth less money. It just means that we had a quality control issue that made it out of here by accident and we will make it right and everything will be fine and the customer will be awesome and it'll be totally cool.
that doesn't make my other products or my whole product line worth less. You're overcharging for your products because you had a bad pick guard. Now, if it happens all the time and it takes the value out of everything that I do, that's another story. And places like Gibson have had to address that and improve what they're doing. So, you know, this is all like a collective thing. And this is, you know, it's important to think about all this stuff as a bigger picture thing. Um, but the one thing I would say is hold the companies accountable for the products that you buy. Don't get on the internet and tell everybody how much they suck because they probably don't. You just got a bad one. And hold the store where you bought it accountable. That is really important because the quality of their dealer network reflects on the brand. And if you bought it at Sweetwater and it's junk, tell your Sweetwater rep, he'll fix it. If you bought it at Guitar Center, don't even leave the store with it. If it's not good, don't take it home. Just don't take it home. And put your money where you can rely on the product. And chances are you will find there are less bad guitars out there than the internet wants you to believe. We did an experiment a couple of months ago, six or eight months ago, where I put a um, email address up. Everybody thought I was farming for email addresses, and actually I've never even looked at anybody's email addresses. But I, I put a video up and I said, email this address with photos of actual problems with your guitar. And there were hardly any. And everybody was talking about Gibson at the time, and there was none. None. There was no Gibsons in the whole bunch of emails that I got. There were all kinds of other stuff. And there was all kinds of quality problems that should have never left the guitar store. You should have never taken those guitars home. So just make sure that you do that. I preach that. Just please hold the guitar player, guitar companies accountable. Um, yeah, I think it's really, really important. Um, my brother's Fender Jag goes out of tune all the time. It's worse when the bridge is locked. I think it's the nut. Pretty sure it's plastic too. Nope. It's a bad setup. You need to take that to a guy who really knows how to set up a Jag and how to make that bridge move back and forth. Cause that bridge is supposed to move. That bridge is supposed to move back and forth. And the brake angle of that bridge, the height of it, the angle of the neck, everything has to be right on a Jaguar or a Jazzmaster for that to work properly. And if it's going out of tune all the time, you need to take that to somebody who really knows how to set one of those up and you won't have any problems after that. I'm probably not the nut. <clears throat> Yes, I hate when people complain about the quality of everything and they don't use the warranty. Preach. Exactly, man. Hold the people accountable and don't complain about it on the internet. Um, we need to educate people on being good consumers for their own good and for everyone's. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Um, when I get a car, you know, I buy a new car. This is probably too much to... Give out, but I, I probably had, I don't know, 50 or 60 cars in my lifetime. And I usually get a new one every couple of years just because it's fun. It's a um, car stuff is really fun for me. And I, I don't let anything fly. If there's a scratch, if there's a ding, uh, the dealerships don't like me. They really like me in the fact that I'm easy and I'll just go in there and buy whatever. And I don't care about... I'll get, I want a good deal, but I'm not going to bend anybody over and, you know, I'm not going to do that kind of stuff. However, if there's a scratch, if there's a ding, if there is a warranty issue, it will get fixed because my cars, when I sell them, are as good as, if not better, conditioned the day I sell them than when I buy them. If, you, if I ever have a car for sale and you want something good, it'll be good because <laughs> I really take care of my stuff. Um, but I'm that way with everything. I hold... I hold you accountable if you um and not in a jerk way you don't have to be a, you know like if i have a bad pickup or something you don't have to you don't have to call me and be like oh and you know bark and make all 
I have have the mentality that I want you to be happy with it when you're done, you know, when and when the guitar's done. So um, it's not that you have to be angry about it with people, but they know when they're doing something right. One hundred percent, they know when something's doing right. What about poor people? I think it's even more important. I think if you don't have, and this, I've always said this on our channel. It's one of the things that I feel like is really important. It's why my channel's even here. Um, is I know that people do not have, uh, they only have a limited amount, everybody, no matter whether you have a lot of money or you don't, you have a limited, usually a limited amount of budget that you can spend on your hobby every month. And you have a limited amount of time that you can spend on your hobby every month because of other financial obligations, lack of finances, whatever. So the idea is to make sure that every minute and every dollar counts. And I think when you don't have a lot of money, it's even more important to make sure that when you buy that affinity telly, that it's set up properly, that you have a good experience with it, that it's, that it's right. So it doesn't matter. Money doesn't, the money part of it doesn't matter. The, the principle of making sure that you have something that you're going to enjoy and that's going to inspire you to play matters more than how much it costs, right? It could be a $2,700 guitar, or it could be a $279, that's how much they cost now, Fender Affinity Telecaster. And it doesn't matter. You should have the same experience. You should be able to sit down with that guitar and know that it's going to play well and that it's going to do what it needs to do. It doesn't matter. The money doesn't matter. Um, yeah. I think that's really, really important. Uh, let's see. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have covered everything. And I think we have covered as much as we can cover in one little hanging out session. This has been super fun. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me for a few minutes and uh, letting me speak my mind a little bit because I don't get to do that a lot on some of these videos. And I think it's important that we just think about this stuff from a little different perspective. I hope you guys have a great day. We're going to have news tomorrow. There's a new Fender Telecaster out. You've probably already seen it, but I learned some things about it today that I'm going to share with you tomorrow that are interesting, and I think you're going to dig it. So we will see you tomorrow at noon for the gear news, and we have a live stream Q&A on Thursday. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you later.